Monica Hawkins, a judge in family court, unexpectedly became a defendant after police stopped her car in response to reports of erratic driving. The officers identified Hawkins and noted a strong smell of alcohol from her vehicle. They asked her to undergo field sobriety tests, which she failed. Nonetheless, Hawkins remained calm and even hummed a tune at the police station, though she was somewhat uncooperative with the testing procedures. So what I'm going to ask is that you provide a breath sample, okay? And if you refuse, then your, driver, your Ohio driver's license will automatically be suspended. Okay. Okay, so are you willing to provide a breath sample? No. No, so you're going to refuse? Yes. Okay. Following a legally obtained warrant, a blood test at the hospital showed her blood alcohol concentration was 0.199, well over the legal limit. Hawkins faced the consequences in court, pleading guilty to driving while intoxicated, a misdemeanor, and was sentenced to 90 days in jail, with 87 days suspended. Subsequently, a complaint for judicial misconduct was lodged against her, bringing her before the Ohio Board of Professional Conduct. Here, she adopted a more humble and cooperative stance, expressing remorse and reflecting on the incident's impact. I've spent my whole life trying to do the next best thing, and be the, the, the perfect person. I have not had a drink since January 31st, 2009. Despite facing public criticism, Hawkins's misdemeanor charge enabled her to continue serving as a family court judge. Armin Maiways had been intrigued by cannibalism since his younger years. In response to Maiways' internet advertisement, Brandis willingly offered himself as a participant, consenting to his own demise and subsequent consumption. This act took place at Maywez's residence and was recorded on video. Maywez was then tried in a German court on charges of ending the life of Brandes and consuming his body, challenging the legal system with the intricate issue of defining murder's limits. His defense argued for a lighter sentence under the premise of killing upon request, which has a five-year maximum sentence. However, the prosecution contended that Mayway should have recognized Brandy's psychological instability and scrutinized his desire to die more closely. Despite Maiwe's cannibalistic obsession, psychiatrists found him to be mentally fit. Ultimately, the judge ruled for a life sentence, overturning an initial eight-year sentence, resulting in Mayway's being sentenced to life in prison without parole. In December, Mark Latunsky, a 53-year-old man from Michigan, encountered Kevin Bacon through the dating app Grinder. Latunsky enticed Bacon to his Bennington Township residence, where he fatally stabbed Bacon in the back, followed by the removal and consumption of parts of Bacon's body. Days after his disappearance, Bacon's body was found naked and hanging from the ceiling in Latunsky's basement, causing shock and dismay in the courtroom. His parents were the first to go be with Jesus. But because of someone who decided to take our son's life, that isn't the case for us. Only 25 years old and had a great career as a hairstylist and hadn't been able to graduate from U of M in psychology, even though they were kind enough to honor him his degree. Such a short life for our son who had a lot to do in this world still. During the trial, Bacon's family shared their profound sorrow and loss through emotional impact statements. Jenny Bacon, Kevin's sister, gave a moving tribute to him, highlighting their close bond. 24, 2019 was the last time I saw my brother Kevin alive. I had to wait three long days to learn of Kevin's unaware to me that he was killed on Christmas Eve night. Kevin meant the world to me, and I will never have another brother like him. The day I learned of Kevin's a part of me with him because he was my first best friend, brother, and protector. Kevin was my protector from cruel people who didn't understand me like he did because of a disability that I was born with. Latunsky was found guilty of first-degree murder and mutilating a corpse. The judge pointed out the deliberate planning behind the crime, stating that Latunsky had orchestrated Bacon's murder, consequently, ability of parole. Alex Murdaugh, a 54-year-old attorney from a well-known legal family, is embroiled in a widely watched legal battle, charged with taking the life of his wife, Maggie Murdaugh, and their son, Paul Murdaugh. He faces two murder charges and two charges for using a weapon during violent crimes. But it is overwhelming, and it shows this man to be a cunning manipulator, a man who placed himself above all others, including his family. Uh, a man who violated the trust of so many, including his friends, his family, 
his partners, his profession, but most of all, Maggie. The prosecution argues that Murdoch killed his family to hide his dubious financial activities and deceitful lifestyle, presenting him as a master manipulator who betrayed the trust of many, including his own family and colleagues. Despite these grave charges, Murdoch claims he is innocent. So, I would never hurt my wife Maggie and I would never hurt my son Paul. Judge Clifton Newman, during sentencing, remarks on Murdaugh's apparent lack of remorse throughout the proceedings. He notes the discrepancy in sentencing for minor crimes, but moves forward with Murdaugh's sentencing. Sentence you to the State Department of Corrections on each of the indictments in the of your wife Maggie Murdaugh. I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life for the murder of Paul Murdaugh, whom you probably love so much. Murdaugh is given two consecutive life sentences without parole for the murders. The trial, which sees the public's interest, underscores a significant downfall for a figure from a notable legal lineage, found guilty of the most severe offenses against his own family. William Bryan, 54, stands trial with Gregory and Travis McMichael, facing charges including murder and involvement in the racially charged killing of Ahmaud Arbery. The trial brings Bryan's racial biases to the forefront, especially highlighting his use of racial slurs towards his daughter's boyfriend just before Arbery's death. Evidence presented by the prosecution suggests a racial motive, with Bryan and the McMichaels engaging in racist language and actions. That we just read, Mr. Bryan is talking about backing up and going at the victim um, and, and saying his belief that the victim was trying to get into his truck, right? Bryan's initial statements post the incident showed racial prejudices, with the prosecution arguing that Arbery's fate would have been different had he been white, pointing to racial bias as a key factor in the case. The evidence includes Bryan's racist communications, such as messages and social media posts, emphasizing racial prejudice's role in the incident. Throughout the trial, the jury examines the racial undertones behind Arbery's demise. Although the defense tries to differentiate Bryan's case by highlighting his early concerns over the incident, Incident, the trial's focus remains on the defendant's racial biases. As far as the remorse, um, I think Roddy Bryan stands in very different shoes. Um, it is obvious from the beginning uh, that he questioned the tragedy that had occurred at the scene. It was on, uh, I believe, I can't remember whose body cam, but the body cam, in fact, questioning whether or not what had occurred had occurred. And then took steps early on in this process I think that demonstrated that he had grave concerns. So the court recognizing that Mr. Bryan's position is different. Uh, again, Mr. Bryan was found not guilty on count one and count two. The court sentences Mr. Bryan to uh, life with the possibility of parole on count three. Bryan is acquitted of the first two counts, but is found guilty on the third count, leading to a life sentence with the possibility of parole. Bryan, alongside the McMichaels, faces life imprisonment. Brian remains motionless and without expression as he receives a life sentence with parole eligibility after 30 years, marking a significant moment in a case underscored by racial tensions and societal reflections on racism. Nehemiah Griego, a teenager from South Valley, New Mexico, took the life of his family. Before the tragic incident, he struggled with both suicidal and homicidal urges. He found two weapons in his parents' wardrobe. On January 19, 2013, Nehemiah used a .22 caliber weapon to take the life of his mother while she was in her bedroom. The sound of the weapon discharge awoke his brother, Zephaniah, whom Nehemiah informed of their mother's death before causing his demise as well. Nehemiah then ended the lives of his two younger sisters, delivering fatal injuries to them. He awaited his father's return from work and executed him with multiple rounds from an AR-15 style semi-automatic weapon. Following the slayings, Nehemiah loaded the weapons into the family's van and headed to his church. There, he attempted to construct an alibi by falsely claiming his family had been in an accident and later informing the church pastor that his father had passed away. A retired homicide detective, feeling something was off, accompanied Nehemiah back to his home. Upon recognizing the horror of the situation, he dialed 911, leading to Nehemiah's capture. At the time of his arrest, Nehemiah was a minor, facing the stark possibility of receiving the death sentence or life in prison without parole under New Mexico's legal statutes. 
Originally, he was sentenced to a juvenile detention center, a decision that was subsequently reversed in favor of sentencing him to three life sentences to be served simultaneously, with an additional seven years added on consecutively. Nehemiah mostly remained mute throughout his trial, but after receiving his sentence, he expressed remorse to his surviving family members for his deeds. Delvin King, a 25-year-old, was caught with a regulated weapon during a traffic stop and charged with weapons offenses. Before these events, he had escaped from the courthouse and eluded police at a preliminary hearing for the same charges. As a result, King had to wear a remote-controlled stun cuff on his leg in court. Representing himself, King claimed to be part of the Moorish American Group, a segment of the sovereign citizen movement that rejects government authority. He argued that the court had no jurisdiction over him, insisting he was not Delvin King. When he disregarded the court's orders to stop speaking, Judge Neely had a deputy activate the stun cuff. Stop. Stop. Mr. Sheriff, do it. Use it. After leaving, and then returning to the courtroom, Neely continued the hearing. King eventually accepted probation before trial, which led to a two-year sentence for the weapon charge, most of which he had already served, avoiding an official conviction. The incident became widely known after courtroom footage was released, leading the Maryland Court of Appeals to strip Neely of his judicial powers. Neely faced a misdemeanor for civil rights violations, to which he pleaded guilty. His punishment included one year of probation, anger management courses, and a $5,000 fine, and he was permanently prohibited from serving as a judge again. Vonda Star Smith, from Afton, Tennessee, was convicted for taking the life of a pregnant woman and her unborn, facing charges of first-degree murder and second-degree murder, respectively. During the trial, a former colleague, Jessica Price, spoke highly of Smith, expressing that she would be greatly missed and highlighting the sadness surrounding the case. Despite these character references, the judge focused on the heinous nature of the crime and the deep suffering inflicted on the victim's family, stressing the trust the victim had placed in Smith over a stranger. Your lacerations to her, her skull and fracture on the top of her skull. She trusted being with you as opposed to being with a stranger. And bad things happen. This murder happened after that. Smith's attorney, Jean Scott, argued for a lighter sentence, pointing to her minimal criminal history and stable job history. Yet, the judge pointed out the victim's vulnerability and the tragic loss of both the mother and the unborn. Tammy Morrison, the victim's mother, shared the devastating impact of the loss on her family, stating no punishment could make up for it. I'm enough justice on this earth, but I can bring my daughter back for my grandchild. My biggest consolation is she will never see her grandchild again. Smith showed emotion during the trial, but was stoic as her sentence was delivered. She received a life sentence for the first-degree murder and an additional 25 years for the second-degree murder of the unborn, as decided by Judge Duggar. Michael Moeller, previously a youth pastor at First United Methodist Church in Troy, engaged in a mentorship with a girl from his congregation, which later became intimate in nature at his residence. The issue came to light in February 2013, leading to his termination from the church. Facing legal repercussions, Moeller was charged with felony battery, but asserted he had no ill intentions towards the girl, her family, or the church, and expressed regret, committing to not repeating such conduct. Prosecutor Tony Kendall advocated for incarceration, highlighting the significant emotional distress inflicted on the victim and provided evidence of grooming via text messages. I don't wanna lay all the blame on her, uh, in talking with her from time to time, it was my impression that she was getting a lot of pressure from church members and other people related to the church. The case faced a setback when the victim ceased cooperating, sparking concerns over possible external influence on her withdrawal. Consequently, Moeller's defense and the prosecution agreed to a plea bargain, altering the charge to aggravated assault. This change allowed Moeller to relinquish his pastoral credentials and avoid the sex offender registry, which would have followed the original charge. I truly know that this was a mistake that I made, and I, I can't take it back. Um, but I know without a doubt that I will do everything I can, and I will, I will 
I will never do anything like this again. His punishment included five years of judicial oversight and community restrictions, particularly around unsupervised interactions with minors and any contact with the victim, in addition to a 60-day sentence in Miami County Jail. Brian Earl Taylor, a 21-year-old, faced judgment for his involvement in a serious criminal act, specifically illegal imprisonment and carrying a concealed weapon. Further, Mr. Canatra. I would ask that you follow the sentence agreement, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Mr. Adams. Nothing further. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Taylor, is there anything you'd like to tell me before I say? The events leading to Taylor's arrest saw him pressing a pistol against someone's abdomen amid a physical confrontation, a moment witnessed by law enforcement officials. At his sentencing, Taylor sought to convey his regrets to both the court and the affected individuals, aiming to soften the impact of his actions through his expression of remorse. Judge O'Brien, my name is Brian Taylor. I would like to start off my speech by saying sorry to the victims. However, Judge O'Brien indicated that, according to sentencing guidelines, Taylor's offenses warranted a prison term ranging between 50 to 100 months. Taylor ultimately received a two-year sentence for the concealed weapon charge and an additional punishment ranging from 18 months to 15 years for the illegal imprisonment offense. Notably, Taylor's courtroom performance or his attempt to communicate his apologies seemed to have a partial effect on the court's decision, leading to the dismissal of five other charges against him. This development implies that Taylor's show of repentance and potentially other mitigating circumstances were taken into account in the court's final verdict, though he still faced considerable incarceration for the primary offenses. Sean Quarter, a 35-year-old officer from the Bloomfield Police Department, was embroiled in a controversial case involving Marcus Jeter. Following a domestic argument, Jeter left his home, only to be pursued by Officer Quarter onto the Garden State Parkway. During a traffic stop initiated by Quarter, Jeter remained in his vehicle, expressing safety concerns. The situation escalated when more officers arrived and a collision occurred with Jeter's car. Quarter then shattered the window of Jeter's vehicle and, with help, forcefully extracted Jeter. Subsequent reports from the officers accused Jeter of attempting to seize Quarter's weapon and assaulting an officer, leading to Jeter facing multiple severe charges. However, new evidence surfaced, resulting in the dismissal of all charges against Jeter. An inquiry into the conduct of the officers led to a grand jury issuing indictments. Before his sentencing, Quarter voiced apprehensions regarding the repercussions of his actions on his family. I love my children more than anything in the world. And uh, I know they need them. I don't want them to have to suffer, switch schools, lose friends, lose the house that they're raised. Marcus Jeter, present in court, criticized Quarter for his dishonesty and disregard for his ethical duties. To say that I resisted, he had a choice. I'm not saying that that messes his character up. I'm not saying that he's not a good guy. I'm just saying that in a situation like this where he has a, an obligation, a moral obligation to tell the truth, he chose not to. Ultimately, Judge Michael Raven convicted Sean Quarter of official misconduct and record tampering, sentencing him to five years in state prison. On September 13, 2017, a tragic event unfolded at Freeman High School in Spokane, Washington, where 15-year-old Caleb Sharp, also known online as Mungo Walker, instigated a deadly incident. Sharp, a seemingly quiet student who posted anti-feminist memes and weapon-related videos on his YouTube channel, was battling severe mental health issues including depression and untreated ADHD. His condition was further exacerbated by his father's emotional abuse and the instability caused by his family's frequent moves. On the tragic day, Sharp arrived at school with a bag full of weapons and ammunition. After his weapon failed to fire, he used a weapon to end the life of Sam Strawn, a fellow student, and then injured three others before being subdued by a school janitor. The investigation revealed Sharp's intention to make a statement against bullying, driven by his own mental anguish, and a previously written suicide note. Following an extensive judicial process, Sharp was sentenced to 40 years in prison. And a child in this day and age who was really crying out for help, was allowed to carry out such a heinous crime when the writing was pretty much on the wall for everyone to see, but no one seriously looked. As counsel correctly pointed out, lots of kids have an IEP. Lots of kids are depressed and confused at what is already likely a turbulent time in their lives. Lots of kids have ADHD, but they don't go 
shoot up a school. Throughout the trial, he displayed little emotion, even when confronted with video evidence of his actions, but he did offer an apology to the victims and the broader community. Bodies in their minds that I can never erase or take back. And most of all, I am sorry to Amy and Emily for taking Sam from them. Sharp's case underscores the critical need for better mental health support for young people, illustrating the dire consequences of failing to provide adequate care and intervention for those struggling with psychological issues. The tragedy at Freeman High School serves as a poignant reminder of the urgent need to bolster support systems for teens facing mental health challenges. In June 2008, the friends of Travis Alexander discovered his body in his bathroom, showing signs of a violent death, including a wound to the forehead, around 30 stab wounds, and a slit throat. During the emergency call, these friends pointed to Jody Arias, Alexander's girlfriend at the time, suggesting her involvement. Arias was subsequently arrested on suspicion of first-degree murder. The trial and investigation that followed spanned over five years, with Arias offering varying accounts of the events leading to Alexander's death. Initially, she denied any involvement, later claimed to have been present during a home invasion, and ultimately argued that she had acted in self-defense. He had his head down. That's what you said, right? He was like a, I can just describe it as like a linebacker unless I get up and act it out, which I would like to not do, if possible. Then do it. Go ahead. Show us how he was standing immediately before, or how he was sitting or crouching immediately before. Despite initially pleading not guilty, Arias later shifted her narrative to include claims of a home invasion and self-defense, even as she maintained she had no memory of stabbing Alexander. Arias attempted to bolster her self-defense claim by presenting private letters alleging past abuse by an ex-boyfriend and testifying on her own behalf. The prosecution argued that the evidence showed Alexander trying to defend himself against Arias's lethal assaults. The court finds the mitigation presented is not sufficiently substantial to call for leniency and that a natural life sentence is appropriate. It is ordered the defendant shall be incarcerated in the Department of Corrections for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. The jury found Arias guilty of first-degree murder and determined she was eligible for the death penalty. Nevertheless, the sentencing judge decided against the death penalty, concluding that the mitigating factors presented by Arias did not justify a departure from a life sentence. Thus, Arias was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. In August 2017, a traffic stop in Euclid, Ohio, led to a highly publicized and contentious incident involving Officer Michael Amott and motorist Richard Hubbard. Captured on video, the footage showed Officer Amott forcibly removing Hubbard from his vehicle, then engaging in physical violence by punching and kicking him multiple times. This act of aggression triggered a public outcry, and the video quickly spread across the internet. The community's response was facilitated by Ohio's revised law, 2935.09.10, which permits citizens with knowledge of a criminal act to request an investigation or arrest warrant from a judge. Utilizing this statute, the people of Euclid were instrumental in advancing legal proceedings against Officer Amot. This started as a uh, petition from citizens in the city of Euclid. Um, many people don't know about Ohio Revised Law 2935.09.10. If you have knowledge of a crime in the state of Ohio, you can petition a judge giving them your evidence for them to do an investigation or to order an arrest. After a protracted legal journey spanning five years, Amat faced the consequences of his actions. He was convicted of assault and interfering with civil rights following a trial that lasted several days and culminated in a jury's verdict. He was wrestling with us and he does throw a punch at me. Amat's defense argued that Hubbard had been resisting arrest and had attempted to strike him, claims countered by the disturbing video evidence and Hubbard's own testimony about the lasting psychological impact of the encounter. I appreciate the, uh, the jury and the court for making the right decision. You know, what Amy, I did something wrong. He should have received the maximum sentences today. You know, I'm still going through like the suffering with the anxiety, you know, driving, just this, the temperament, the trauma and everything, just is a cause for this this case. I'm, I'm ready to get it over it actually, but just coming back in here just like bring up everything, you know, and just to see him over there, you know, see all this, just coming back in this court, just like, it's, it just brings up everything, like we live in the moment, just so you know. I hope you get the maximum sentences in the day, you know.
In delivering the sentence, the court imposed a 90-day jail term on Amit, alongside an $11,000 fine and a year of non-reporting community control. The court at this time will impose a sentence of uh, 90 days, uh, require you to pay a fine of $1,000, and will require you to pay the court costs. In addition, the court will suspend the sentence of 90 days, uh, place you on non-reporting community control for a period of one year. Uh, if you violate during that one year, then the court will retain the ability to impose the sentence. However, the jail sentence was suspended, indicating that Ahmad would avoid incarceration provided he adhered to the conditions of his community control for the ensuing year. Kaylee Juga, a 15-year-old, and her mother, Stephanie Juga, were tragically targeted in an assault by Kaylee's former boyfriend, Martise Fuller. The relationship between Kaylee and Fuller had ended weeks prior to the incident. On May 9, 2019, as the Juga family was preparing for a camping excursion, Kaylee was at their home, engaged with her music, unaware of the looming threat. Fuller, harboring resentment from the breakup and attributing his expulsion from school and dismissal from the football team to Kaylee, armed himself and stealthily entered her bedroom, exploiting his knowledge of the home's interior from past visits. He then inflicted five fatal wounds upon Kaylee. Upon hearing the sound of a weapon, Stephanie Juga hurried to her daughter's assistance, only to suffer two wounds inflicted by Fuller herself. Miraculously, she survived the ordeal. Fuller was apprehended and faced charges of murder, attempted murder, and burglary. Despite his claims of innocence and assertions that media representations had unfairly demonized him, the evidence presented was compelling. The weapon he had entrusted to a relative for disposal was identified as the weapon used in the crime, and Stephanie Juga's courtroom testimony further reinforced the case against him. Shot. I stopped in my doorway, and I looked at him, and I said, Oh my God, Mark, please. I said, Please, you don't have to do this. And he looked at me, and he said, Yes. Ultimately, Martise Fuller was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Throughout the sentencing, he exhibited neither remorse nor guilt, maintaining a detached demeanor as the judge pronounced the judgment. John Camphill, a former law enforcement officer, was implicated in a devastating accident that struck five students from Dundee Ridge Middle Academy as they walked near their bus stop, tragically resulting in the death of 13-year-old Jaheim Robertson. My son was mowed down and, and killed by John Camphill. An ex-cop who chose to drink, to drink your sorrows away. At the time of the collision, Camphill was found to have a blood alcohol content twice the legal limit. An off-duty Polk County deputy, who is also a parent and witnessed the aftermath, pursued Camphill following the incident. Observations noted Camphill's apparent intoxication and stumbling behavior at the crash site. You mean saying, Daddy, help me. I s your daughter. During the legal proceedings, the immense sorrow and the profound impact of their son's loss were voiced by Jaheim Robertson's parents. In his defense, Camphill argued that he suffered a blackout caused by a medical condition related to his liver, insisting he had not consumed alcohol on the day of the accident. Controlling the events that occurred on April 27th, I had not been drinking at all that day. Despite his claims, the court, emphasizing the severe repercussions of drunk driving and the irreplaceable loss of a young life, opted to permanently revoke Camphill's driving privileges and handed down a sentence that could see him spending the remainder of his life in jail. David Oliver, once celebrated as the outspoken police chief of Brimfield Township known for his candid and often humorous Facebook posts about criminals he dubbed mopes, found himself entangled in a web of legal difficulties. Oliver was charged with four misdemeanors, including unlawful restraint, attempted theft, simple assault, and unauthorized use of property, signaling a stark reversal in his professional narrative. During his sentencing, the judge pointedly labeled Oliver a mope, invoking the same term Oliver had famously used to describe wrongdoers. You become the mope that you wrote about in your book. This moment of irony highlighted the dramatic turn in Oliver's life. Facing multiple accusations, including attempted theft in his capacity as a public official and assault, Oliver opted for a no contest plea, signifying his choice not to dispute the charges while not admitting guilt. 
Central to Oliver's downfall were allegations from Crystal Casterline, a female officer in his department who accused him of harassment. To you, that Crystal punched me as, as much as I punched her. Casterline's testimony detailed a progression from inappropriate conduct to overt harassment, casting a shadow over Oliver's character and career. Despite his reservations about the validity of many accusations, Oliver decided to plead guilty to all charges, a move aimed at closing this tumultuous chapter of his life and moving forward. I was a marathon runner. I loved life. I snuggled my little girls constantly. And I was naive. I was naive. I never understood domestic violence, how it gets that fogs escalated to groping me, trapping me places and forcing me into positions where he would press his body into mine, forcing me to dance with him. The court sentenced Oliver to two years of probation and mandated restitution. Additionally, a permanent ban from police work was imposed, definitively ending his tenure in law enforcement. This conclusion marked a significant fall from grace for the former police chief, whose career once thrived on his unique approach to engaging with the community and tackling crime. In 2013, Michael Dotro, a police officer, deliberately set his supervisor's house on fire using gasoline. At the time of the arson, the supervisor's wife, their two kids, and a 92-year-old grandmother were inside but escaped unharmed, though the house was significantly damaged. Dotro was later charged with several serious offenses, including attempted homicide, arson, misconduct as a police officer, conspiracy to tamper with a witness, and plotting retaliation. At his trial, which lasted almost an hour, Dotro didn't say anything, as the judge criticized him for his actions and noted how his behavior made victims hesitant to trust the criminal justice system. This individual has done, because of him and people like him, victims are afraid to come forward to be part of the criminal justice system. Dotro's legal troubles didn't end with the arson. He also admitted to misusing police records and plotting against a North Brunswick police officer who had given him a ticket for driving under the influence. But what he's really done, and what we're gonna be left with after he's walking out the door to spend the next third of his life in prison, for his crimes, Dotro was given a 20-year sentence for the attempted murder charge, 10 years for setting the fire, and for misconduct, 5 years for plotting to interfere with a witness, and 18 months for planning revenge. All these sentences were ordered to be served at the same time, so he will serve a total of 20 years. During a hearing at the Fresno Criminal Courthouse, 31-year-old inmate Brandon Brophy, who was there for a burglary charge, made a sudden escape attempt. Even though he was shackled, Brophy managed to run into the hallway. A deputy quickly engaged with him to prevent the escape. In the ensuing struggle, Brophy tried to grab the deputy's weapon. Initially, two bystanders hesitated to get involved as they watched the scene unfold. Despite Brophy's size advantage over the deputy, his attempt to flee was stopped thanks to the courageous intervention of a bystander who put Brophy in a headlock, aiding the deputy in subduing him. Additional deputies and court staff soon arrived to help secure Brophy. He was then restrained more securely and wheeled back to jail in a wheelchair. After this incident, Brophy faced new arrests and was taken to Fresno County Jail, where he was booked with additional felony charges for trying to escape, adding to his existing burglary charge. His bail was set at $1,693,000, and he now awaits further court proceedings. On April 20, 2018, the 19th anniversary of the Columbine High School tragedy and during a nationwide student protest against weapon violence, 19-year-old Sky Boucher initiated an attack at Forest High School in Ocala, Florida. I'm alone in my house and there's nothing to do, so the depression and that rage came back, so I expressed it in violence in public, which I shouldn't have done. Boucher smuggled a weapon into the school inside a guitar case then donned a tactical vest and gloves in a bathroom before firing at a classroom door that was locked. This action, described as a plea for help rather than an attempt at widespread violence, resulted in Boucher surrendering to a former teacher just three minutes after the incident began. I mean, like I thought there would be, and I just got into the bathroom. I took my time putting on my gloves, my, my tactical vest. He expressed a desire for arrest, citing ongoing mental health struggles, and recounted a history of neglect and violence from his childhood. On the day of the attack, Boucher had initially intended to seclude himself due to his unstable emotional state, hoping to prevent any harm. His plan changed upon encountering a student, 
which deterred him from pursuing further violence. Unfortunately, he wounded a 17-year-old student who was behind the targeted door, although the injury was not life-threatening. They just do something and, you know, I, I spend most of my time in a, in a room alone, so, like, I'm getting this rush. Boucher faced numerous charges, including terrorism and aggravated assault with a weapon, resulting in a 30-year prison sentence with eligibility for parole after 25 years. Following his imprisonment, Boucher will also be under 30 years of probation and must make restitution. Arthur Haig, a church pastor, is in a disagreement with his estranged wife, Lillian, because he won't sign a deed to sell their house. Judge William Watkins, overseeing their case, warns Haig right at the start not to interrupt or face jail time. Watkins is visibly upset with Haig, thinking Haig leaked Watkins' personal info, leading to a news article about Watkins' home. Mr. Haig, if you say one word out of turn, you're going to jail. Do you understand? After we closed here, you went out there and talked to a reporter. This morning, I now see an article with a picture of my home. My home. Surprised. The article was about Watkins' involvement in a local homeowners group and didn't mention Haig, but Watkins blamed him anyway and showed his anger in court. You swear to testimony that gives me the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so God. Yes. In the end, Watkins decided Lillian was right, telling Arthur to sign the deed for the house sale and pay $500 to someone else to make it happen faster. Ms. Wallace, what's the nature of your motion? Yep, the closing attorney is requiring his signature. I'm going to direct that Mr. Haig pay him the sum of $500 for his services no later than Friday. Arthur complained about Watkins to a judicial panel. After the complaint, Watkins stepped back from the case admitting he reacted too strongly. A deeper look into Watkins showed he often behaved badly towards people in court, using bad language, and not doing his job right, like not handling protective orders properly. I don't travel. Ma'am, I didn't ask you for a, a, a speech. I, I'm not, well, I'm, I'm not, not, you know, you're saying hush. That. The West Virginia Court of Appeals looked into it and found Watkins guilty of 24 misconducts. They suspended him without pay for the rest of his term. 30-year-old Diobra Wren found himself back in court for a sentencing hearing after admitting guilt to attempted battery charges. I think everybody would agree he's definitely a threat. I mean, I've been doing this for over four decades. I've seen fights in the courtrooms. I've seen outbursts. Uh, but this was one of a cut. Wren initially sought mercy, arguing he was in a much improved state of life and pushing for probation over jail time. I feel like I shouldn't be like sent to prison. Despite this, the judge pointed out Wren's significant past criminal activities, including robbery and battery convictions, showing doubt towards Wren's plea for leniency. Got a lot going on, sir. I'm in a better place in my life. But I think it's time that you get a taste of something else because I just can't with that history. The situation escalated dramatically when Wren, in a sudden and aggressive move, jumped over the bench and assaulted the judge, causing immediate chaos in the courtroom as court officers and attendees scrambled to control the situation. Wren's foster mother, Karen Springer, expressed deep dismay and sadness in an interview, revealing Wren was not on his medication when the attack happened. She condemned his actions, stating he just snapped. What he did, no shape, form, or fashion do I condone it. You know, I was just as heartbreaking and shocked as anyone else. But like he told me, he, he just snapped. It really is very disturbing that someone would just snap like that. And it could have easily been a lot worse. After this episode, Wren was due back in court to face new charges stemming from the attack, but refused to leave his cell, leading to a delay in the proceedings. He declined to use the tunnel system that connects the courthouse with the jail. Despite the attack, the judge suffered no serious injuries, although a court officer was injured and needed hospital treatment. For nearly two decades, Larry Nasser, the former team doctor for the United States Women's National Gymnastics Team, exploited his position and the trust placed in him. Under the guise of medical treatment, he preyed upon hundreds of young female athletes, subjecting them to unspeakable abuse. His actions came to light in 2016, leading to federal court proceedings where he pleaded guilty. In Michigan state courts, Nassar faced multiple counts of assault and received a staggering total of 175 years in prison. During the sentencing, a poignant moment occurred when Randall Margrave, the father of three victims, stepped forward. 
the impact of Nassar's crimes reverberated far beyond the courtroom, forever altering the lives of those affected. Let's see what happens next. Judge Widow, just drop father, have a chance to say something. Go ahead, sir. Mm -hmm. You son of a we, we don't want to swear. We don't want to have profanity. I can't imagine the anger and the anxiety and the feeling of wanting retribution. And if you need to say something to help you, I'm more than willing to let you say something. But in a courtroom, we, we, try, we don't use profanity. But if you have some words that you would like to say, I would like to give you the opportunity to say them. I would ask you to, as part of the sentencing, to grant me five minutes in a locked room with this <laughs> demon. I have would a you do that? I, I, that is not yes how our, or no? No, sir, I can't Would you give me that. one minute? I, you know that I can't do that. That's not how our legal well, system I'm works. Well, I'm going to have to get Where is he? You guys. Not like that. No one can behave like this. I want to make sure it's crystal clear. You cannot behave like this. This is letting him have this power over us, okay? So you will come out and tell me this. I don't want to see another pair get arrested or put handcuffs on or a victim. We cannot behave like this. I understand Mr. Margrave's frustration, but you cannot do this. This is not helping your children. This is not helping your community. This is not helping us. This is not helping the police department. Use your words. Use your experiences to get him into change. Do not use physical violence. On the second day of Larry Nassar's sentencing at the Eaton County Courthouse in Charlotte, Michigan, Randall Margrave attempted to confront Nassar. However, Eaton County Sheriff's deputies swiftly intervened, tackling Margrave to prevent any further escalation. The tension in the courtroom was palpable as emotions ran high during this intense moment in the legal proceedings. On Independence Day, an altercation in a parking lot at Joy and Franklin, following a disagreement that started in Roseville, Michigan, led to Jeffrey Clark allegedly firing multiple times at Jeray Robertson resulting in Robertson's death. Clark was later brought before a Macomb County courtroom for a preliminary hearing. The prosecution introduced evidence during the hearing, including surveillance footage from the scene of the crime. The situation in the courtroom escalated when Robertson's twin brother lunged at Clark, striking him repeatedly in the head and back. Despite Clark's attempts to defend himself, his movements were limited by a waist restraint. Lawyers and deputies quickly intervened to break up the fight with Clark being escorted out amidst shouts directed at Robertson's brother, hinting that others would see his deeds. Man, they don't see you. Do you need an ambulance or any medical attention? 
Following this disturbance, Robertson's brother was detained right there in the courtroom, handcuffed, and made to sit down. In 2020, DeSean Brown was involved in the tragic death of Nitaisha Lattimore, his girlfriend at the time. He also placed Nitaisha's son, Nilo Lattimore, alive into the Ohio River. Nilo's body was never found. During a judicial proceeding in Cincinnati, Nilo's father, Antonio Hughes, overwhelmed by emotion, assaulted DeSean Brown, the defendant, by rushing at him and landing multiple punches. Law enforcement officers had to step in to halt Hughes, who made another attempt to attack Brown as soon as he regained his stance. For his actions in the courtroom, Antonio Hughes was charged with contempt and was subsequently sentenced to a week in jail. Meanwhile, DeSean Brown is facing legal proceedings with charges that include two counts of murder related to the deaths of Nitisha Lattimore and her son, Nilo. Anthony Kirkland had done time 16 years, to be exact, for taking the life of his ex, but once he got out, things took a dark turn. Kirkland went on a three-year killing spree, ending the lives of four women, two of them just teenagers. The spree ended after the fourth murder when he got nabbed. They found him with one victim's watch and iPod, sealing his fate as the prime suspect. They say I am evil and a monster. They're right. Even my mom hated me, but I don't blame her. Kirkland had to face the consequences in court, and when they rattled off the charges, especially the ones for aggravated murders, he looked like he might pass out. No surprise, he got nailed on all counts. With his crimes being as serious as it gets, they threw the death penalty at him. Count four, aggravated murder. Now, Kirkland's biding his time on death row at Chillicothe Correctional Facility, waiting for the end. Jordan Fuss, a 22-year-old hailing from Davy, found himself behind the wheel while under the influence of alcohol. Behind the wheel of his 2004 Infiniti G35, he had been sipping on rum with a passenger along for the ride. Fuss, clearly impaired, was barreling down the road at an alarming speed, clocking over 90 miles per hour. The collision occurred at the intersection of Davy and Sterling Roads, where Fuss's car, weaving between lanes, failed to slow down. The unfortunate occupants of the other vehicle were Nancy Severeda, her daughter, and her son, Santiago Mondragon. Although Severeda and her daughter survived, the heartbreaking reality was that Santiago lost his life at the scene. Facing the consequences of his actions, Fuss was hit with multiple charges, including reckless driving, vehicular homicide, and DUI manslaughter. His blood alcohol level was a staggering 0.21% three times the legal limit. In the 2017 court proceedings, Fuss appeared visibly scared and remorseful. His attorney tried to underscore his regret in an attempt to lessen the severity of his sentence. Despite Fuss's genuine expressions of remorse, the judge handed down a 14-year prison sentence. Throughout the proceedings, Fuss couldn't hold back tears, openly expressing regret and apologizing for the irreversible harm caused. The aftermath of the incident had a lasting impact on the victim's family, underscoring the stark reality that, despite remorse, no amount of regret can resurrect a life lost in such a tragic accident. Amber Geyer, an off-duty police officer in Dallas, Texas, mistakenly entered the apartment of Botham Jean, located directly above her own, after a lengthy shift, thinking it was her residence. In the confusion, Believing Jean to be an intruder, Geyer drew her weapon and opened fire at Jean, who was merely relaxing on his couch, watching television and enjoying some ice cream. You can tell it's open a little bit. I'm like, someone's in here. I hear you moving around. And so I automatically draw my weapon. Amber Geiger firmly and reasonably believed that she had confronted an intruder in her apartment. Throughout her trial, Geyer maintained that she had mistaken Jean's apartment for her own, 
and thought she was defending herself against an intruder. I'm holding the door open. I see the shadow way back there. I said, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There he ended up towards the armrests of the couch, and I times. I'm thinking because he's moving around so much, he's not listening. The jury, however, found Geyer guilty of murder as per the charges. The courtroom remained orderly when the verdict was announced. You weren't on the third floor. Yes. But you believe you were? I believed I was. And the figure was moving around as you described? Yes, I had my pointed, and I'm saying, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. And then he began coming towards you? Yes. Why did you <laughs> so I was scared. I was scared this person said if I was going to hurt me, and I'm right. so sorry. Right. I'm sorry. How do you feel what you did? I feel like a terrible person. And I hate myself every single day. I wish he was the one with the gun that killed me. For ending the life of Botham Jean, Geyer received a prison sentence of 10 years. We the jury unanimously find the defendant, Amber Geiger, guilty of as charged in the indictment. No outburst. The defendant's punishment at 10 years imprisonment. During the sentencing, Botham Jean's younger brother, Brant, made a poignant victim impact statement, extending forgiveness to Geyer. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that if you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it, but I love you just like anyone else. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I don't know if this is possible, but can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. Amber Geyer is now serving her sentence at Mountain View State Prison in Gatesville, Texas, with parole eligibility in 2024. Taylor Shad Business was engaged in an intimate relationship with 24-year-old Shad Dean, during which both were under the influence of substances. Business confessed to fatally strangling Diane and then dismembering his body using kitchen knives available in their residence. The gruesome discovery of Dian's decapitated head in a bucket in the basement was made by his mother at the family's home. They found part of Shad at his mom's house. Found his head. Where's the rest of his body? It's there. It's at his house. Oh, Why are you there? So we're we gonna take that somewhere. I like that. So you dismembered the body too? Yeah. Following this, business was apprehended and charged with murder. At her trial, she entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. However, the jury concluded she was mentally competent at the time of the crime. The defendant strangled her friend Shad Theory into using a dog collar, that after he was subsequently dismembered him using kitchen knives found in the home. They convicted Shab business of first-degree intentional homicide, resulting in a life sentence without the chance of parole. We, the jury, find the defendant, Taylor Denise Shabusiness, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. In a moving moment during the proceedings, Shad Dian's father offered forgiveness to business, acknowledging his belief in her capacity for change and extending his best wishes for her future. Hello, I just wanted to say that uh, I forgive you for what you've done to my son. Yeah, you made a bad choice, and now you have to live with it. I'm going to miss Shad. He was a wonderful child, too. He, growing up, just mild-mannered and just happy, and I know you made a bad choice, and uh, like I said, I forgive you, and I'm going to ask the judge if he can, you know, if she can see the streets again sometime, you know. It may not be soon, but I believe everybody uh, makes bad choices, and maybe not to the scale, but uh, I think there's a lot of hope for you. You know, you can make use of your time and be a better person and uh, do great things, yeah, you know. So it does no good for me to hate you, you know. I know you got a heart. I know you got a mind. I wish you no harm, and I hope things go well for you. That's all I got to say. Mr. Business, this is your opportunity to address me. If there's anything on your mind you'd like to say before I pass sentence. No, there isn't. Okay. Mr. Shabizness be sentenced as follows. I'm going to impose uh, life imprisonment without the possibility of extended supervision. Shab Business is now serving her life sentence at the Te Chita Correctional Institution in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Vicente Rodriguez Ortiz, aged 23, was found guilty for taking the life of two individuals in Grand Rapids, Michigan. In a tragic event, he targeted a vehicle where 17-year-old Andre Hawkins was present. 
opening fire on a person Rodriguez mistakenly thought was romantically linked to his former partner. Following his arrest, Rodriguez inadvertently disclosed his involvement in another murder during questioning. This led to charges against him for the murder of 50-year-old Lori Lundberg. When the trial for Lundberg's murder commenced, Rodriguez entered a no-contest plea to second-degree murder, which meant he accepted the conviction without directly admitting guilt. During the sentencing, Lundberg's sister spoke up. I can only imagine how empty a heart must be to have so little regard for life. I will pray for you, Vicente. Hawking's mother also spoke and forgave Rodriguez for her son's death. In order to get through this process, I had to forgive you, and I forgive you from the bottom of my heart. I pray for you because as a mother, you're a child to me, and in my heart, I have no anger or bitterness towards you. As a mom, I just want to hug you. I'll never get to see my son be married and have a family, and I couldn't see him walk across the stage and get his high school diploma. It was his senior year, and life was going good for us, and you not only robbed him and us of that, you also robbed yourself. I just want to say I'm sorry, Ms. Hawkins. Rodriguez received a sentence of 35 to 75 years for the murder of Lundberg, alongside a life sentence without the possibility of parole for the murder of Hawkins. He is currently serving his time at the Saginaw Correctional Facility in Freeland, Michigan. In 2010, 17-year-old David Moses, along with two other teens, broke into 81-year-old Dorothy Sessions' house with the intent to rob it. The break-in took a violent turn when Moses attacked Session, inflicting severe harm such as a broken nose, lost teeth, black eyes, and cuts to her mouth. Tragically, Session later died from her injuries. For his part in the crime, Moses, despite his juvenile status, was tried as an adult and, in 2012, received a sentence of 25 years to life in prison. Eight years later, in 2020, Moses was given a chance for resentencing due to updated laws concerning life sentences for juveniles. However, the court decided against altering his sentence after considering his prison conduct and demeanor during court proceedings. During the resentencing, Moses exhibited a lack of seriousness, showing signs of boredom and amusement, and even fell asleep twice, behavior that likely influenced the court's decision to uphold his original sentence. In 2019, Aaron Dean, a former police officer in Fort Worth, was dispatched to perform a wellness check at the residence of Atiana Jefferson's mother. Atiana Jefferson, a 28-year-old African-American woman, was spending time with her nephew playing video games in the living room when Dean arrived on the scene. Without announcing his presence, Dean walked around the house and upon seeing Atiana through a window, commanded her to raise her hands. Almost immediately after, he discharged his weapon through the window, fatally wounding Atiana. Dean left the police department in the aftermath of the incident. He faced manslaughter charges for the death of Atiana. During the trial, body camera footage was shown, and although Dean's partner, who was also at the location, testified he did not see Atiana with a weapon, Dean himself claimed he saw her armed and fired in self-defense. Did you ever see a Tatiana's? No, ma'am. My, my... I saw her face. That burned in your memory? Yes, sir. What do you see? I just saw the silhouette of the person, and I don't recall seeing hands, but I, I did see that weapon pointed at me. You're not saying the on the floor? No, the was pointed directly at me. And about how high up on the silhouette was it in your mind when you're looking at this? Maybe mid chest. I'm, I'm not sure. Reads: We, the jury, find the defendant Aaron, De Aaron York Dean guilty of the offense of manslaughter, as signed and signed by the presiding juror. The jury concluded that Aaron Dean was guilty of manslaughter, sentencing him to 11 years and 10 months in prison. Franklin Williams faced conviction on various serious charges, including armed robbery and eluding police in Cleveland, Ohio. During his sentencing, Williams persistently spoke out of turn disregarding the judge's multiple requests for silence. Do not let me that means one. zip it right now. You're trying to Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. That's so, a violation of the hip hole judge. Here we go. His continual interruptions led the judge to make the unusual decision to have his mouth taped shut. If you spit on, attempt to bite, or injure any of my deputies, you're going to have a bad day. That's what it is. 
At a later hearing, Williams aired his opinions on the right to free speech. Freedom of speech, no duct tape with the hashtags. I faced a potential maximum consecutive sentence of 134 years. I ordered a 24-year sentence. Initially, he received a 24-year prison sentence, but following the judge's reflection on the decision to use duct tape, an apology was issued. The original sentence was vacated, and a different judge was assigned to the case, who then sentenced Williams to 33 years in prison. Jason Howard was accused of being involved in the demise of his girlfriend Jamila West, but on this day, November 16, 2006, he was actually in court for another case. He was the main suspect in the taking the life of Philip Daly and was facing a murder charge. While waiting for his trial to start, chained up, Jamila's brother, Louis West, suddenly attacked him in the courtroom. The family of Jamila was convinced Howard had ended her life, even though there wasn't strong proof. During the attack, a reporter tried to pull Howard away by his chains, and a court officer tackled Lewis West. But the chaos didn't stop there. Lewis West's cousin also jumped in and attacked Howard, causing even more disorder. Soon after, more officers came to get control of the situation, and both Lua West and his cousin were arrested for assault and contempt of court. Despite all the drama and his ongoing legal issues, Jason Howard ended up getting a life sentence. I mean, I was a protector and a provider for my family, but I wasn't there to protect him but, and, and die with him. And I wish I was. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I'd rather be dead. Right? He always said he didn't took the life of Jamila West during his time in court. After his father, Chris Davis, died from ALS in 2007, nine-year-old Zachary Davis started showing signs of mental illness. The situation got worse when his mom stopped his therapy and moved the family to Sumner County, Tennessee for a fresh start. Despite his mom, Melanie Davis, working hard as a paralegal and being active as a triathlete to keep her family happy, Zachary fell deeper into disturbing thoughts, becoming fascinated with serial killers and torture, and filling his notebooks with dark ideas. On August 10, 2012, following a movie night with his mom and brother, Zachary seemed to be preparing to run away, packing a bag with various items. But he had a much more horrifying plan. That night, he took the life of his sleeping mother with a sledgehammer, tried to set their house on fire with his older brother Josh inside, and then ran away. I could just hear the hammer hitting her head. And what did it sound like? It was this uh, wet something sound. <laughs> The fire alarm woke Josh, who found their mom and escaped to a neighbor's house for help. Zachary was caught almost 10 miles away from home. In a chilling confession, he said he was following his late father's voice, telling him to do it and showed no regret, even saying he wished he had ended the life of his brother too. At his trial, Zachary falsely accused his brother, but his lawyer quickly dismissed it. Despite his clear mental issues, the court held him accountable, sentencing him to life in prison with the chance for parole. Zachary showed no emotion when he heard his sentence. Sarah Johnson, whose parents Diane and Alan Scott Johnson had been together since high school and had another child, Matt, who was 22, was a well-liked top student at Wood River High School in Haley, Idaho. However, her life took a turn when she started dating Bruno Santos, a 19-year-old undocumented immigrant from Mexico and gang member, causing tension at home. Sarah's dad even threatened to report Santos for statutory misconduct due to their disagreements. After sneaking out to see Santos and being caught, her dad grounded her. On September 2, 2003, Sarah took a weapon from their guest house and took the life of both her parents while they were asleep. With the guidance of the Lord and the continued love and support of those that believe in me, I'm safe. She then went to a neighbor's, claiming an intruder ended the life of his parents. But inconsistencies in her story and DNA evidence led to her conviction for the murders on March 16, 2005, and she received a life sentence, spared the death penalty due to her age. Daniel Pietrick, who was born on August 24, 1991, and lived in Wellington, Ohio with his parents, had a seemingly normal life until a severe skiing accident left him confined to his home during recovery. This period marked a turning point in Daniel's behavior and his family dynamics. During this time, he started playing the Halo video game series for about nine hours a day after a friend introduced him to it, which worried his father, Mark Pietrick, a Pentecostal minister. 
Due to the game's violent nature, concerned, Daniel's father took the game away and locked it in a safe that also held a weapon. About a week later, Daniel took the game and the weapon from the safe. On October 20th, 2007, he tragically fired at his parents in the head while they were sitting on the couch after asking them to close their eyes. He then tried to make it look like a murder-suicide by placing the weapon in his father's hand. Daniel's plan was interrupted when his sister and her husband came over earlier than expected to watch a baseball game and found the scene. Daniel didn't hurt them and ran away instead. I ran out there with my mom, and then you said he was sorry, and then you at first, Daniel tried to blame the murders on his father, but when his father miraculously survived, the real story came out. Remarkably, his father advocated for leniency and a lighter sentence for Daniel, showing deep forgiveness and love. His pain did not run deep. I guarantee you, I would not be standing here speaking on his behalf. I call him like I see him. Influenced by the father's request, the community's support, and Daniel's seeming regret, the judge gave him the minimum sentence of 23 years, making him eligible for parole in 2030. Paul Wade, 31, was arrested for the murders of 26-year-old Edward Lamont Smith and Alexis McCrary. The court is holding him on homicide-related charges. During a hearing, as Wade's stand-in lawyer speaks, the victim's families cause a stir with their murmurs, disrupting the session. This is a little bit different. Mr. Eggert is... Quiet in court a court officer warns them, and the judge threatens to remove them, yet they argue their right to be there as family. I have to leave the corporate. Their murmuring persists, despite the warnings. Okay. No talking in the courtroom. Oh. Go ahead. When Wade is leaving, he seems to insult the family, sparking a chaotic scene. Family members rush after him, one even pushing him in the hallway, making him hit his head. Attempts to de-escalate fail, and court officers have to use pepper spray on two people and evacuate the courtroom. The judge, while maintaining order, acknowledges the family's grief. Wade is kept in custody. Four family members, Joshua Smith, Isaiah Smith, Joshua Whetstone, and Manitra Kane, face charges for their actions in court. The sentencing of Tristan Lamoureux for the murder of 19-year-old Misty Lamoureux in Utah was marked by intense drama and deep emotional distress. Tristan faced accusations of murdering Misty Lamoureux, having a weapon despite legal restrictions, a third-degree felony, and a Class A misdemeanor for evading police. He confessed to taking Misty's life, who was found with five bullet wounds in her head in the bathroom of the apartment they shared. Tristan was captured by police following a short foot pursuit on the day of the crime, which was notably violent, with Misty found beside a lighter and a burning cigarette. The courtroom atmosphere became highly charged during the sentencing, especially when Misty's brother, Jason Wilson, was given the floor. His attempt to approach Tristan sparked a tense altercation. In light of the plea agreement, the charges for weapon possession and fleeing from law enforcement were dismissed. Tristan received a prison sentence of 15 years to life. The courtroom altercation, requiring Jason to be restrained and escorted out, underscored the deep sorrow and rage Misty's family felt towards the tragedy. 17-year-old Mackenzie Sharilla was convicted of murder after intentionally crashing her car into a commercial building outside Cleveland at a speed of 100 miles per hour, leading to the death of her boyfriend, Dominic Russo, and his friend, Davin Flanagan. She his property. Mm -hmm. She tried yes. to break into his house. Correct. The prosecutors highlighted Sharilla's turbulent relationship with Russo, including threats of violence against him and his possessions, arguing that the crash was a deliberate act aimed at killing Russo, with Flanagan's death being an unfortunate byproduct. Surveillance footage captured Sharilla driving normally before suddenly speeding up and ramming into the building, suggesting the crash was planned. See her driving very calmly and making the right turn, and then all evidence indicates she immediately put the pedal to the metal and drove straight into a building at 100 miles per hour. I think those really demonstrated to us that this was no accident. Upon conviction for murder for both deaths, 
Sharilla expressed regret, stating she couldn't recall the incident but was sorry for her actions. The families of Don and Davia, I'm so deeply sorry. I hope one day you can see I would never let this happen or do it on purpose. I wish I could remember what happened. I'm just so sorry. I'm heartbroken. There was no medical condition that caused this as an accident. There was no mechanical failure of the car. A failed suicide attempt is not a defense. There's a very good likelihood, Mackenzie, that you will spend the rest of your life in prison. She's sentenced on count one, 15 years to life. Count two, 15 years to life, to be served concurrent to each other. Despite her expressed remorse, the judge imposed a sentence of 15 years to life in prison for each murder charge, with both sentences to run at the same time. This is Lisette Gonzalez, who was initially convicted of DUI, but her lawyer challenged the conviction due to the lack of formal sobriety tests, such as a breathalyzer or blood test. Officer Michael Wagner had claimed Gonzalez was over the legal alcohol limit, but later acknowledged a mistake, though he maintained he observed signs of intoxication. Not enough evidence presented for the jury to find the verdict that they did. They didn't do all the, the, the field sobriety examinations that should have been done. Grant the judgment notwithstanding the verdict. The defense requested Judge Fred Schott to overturn the jury's conviction, citing the absence of definitive tests to prove guilt. Yeah, we have this other case for driving a license suspended. Additionally, Gonzalez was later charged with driving on a suspended license, a consequence of incorrect documentation by Officer Wagner. Judge Schott dismissed this charge due to paperwork issues. The case was fishy, and I have no idea how the you know what? Address on file. You know what? State intends to amend I'm granting. I am. I, I'm, I'm, I'm rescinding the sentence. I'm granting the JOA. After reviewing the DUI case, including Officer Wagner's actions and testimony, which he found insufficient for a lawful arrest, Judge Schott took the unusual step of overturning the jury's verdict, acquitting Gonzalez of the DUI. I'm granting the JOA in fairness. In fairness, because yeah. you don't like the state's decision today, Your Honor, on the case? No, you, you don't. Okay. Now that I consider what Officer Wagner testified to and how many times he basically tripped over himself just to arrest this lady with no real probable cause, you're done. Motion to JOA is granted. And you're not going to provide a written order on that? This reversal was based on the re-evaluation of the evidence and questions regarding Officer Wagner's reliability. Consequently, Lisette Gonzalez was cleared of all charges, highlighting a unique case where judicial review led to overturning a jury's decision, underscoring the importance of substantial evidence and arrest legitimacy. In February 2019, Montana Baronet, a 23-year-old from Baltimore, known for his dangerous reputation, was convicted and received two life sentences, marking the end of his criminal activities. At his sentencing, only Valencia Bulock, the mother of one of his victims, Antonio Addison, dared to speak up, highlighting the widespread fear Baronet instigated. Baronet offered a superficial apology claiming Addison was a friend he had cautioned about street life. His criminal career, starting at 13, included leading a major illicit trafficking ring in Sandtown and participating in a highly violent shooting near the University of Maryland Baltimore campus in July 2015, where his group fired over 50 rounds. Who were born and raised and continue to live on the streets of Baltimore who don't make that choice that Mr. Barron, just what's at stake and just how to make sure my police department performs at a high level and partners with our partners of matter. What struck me is that over the past four nights, I've met with hundreds upon hundreds of people. The trial, attended by Baltimore's police commissioner, Michael Harrison, was heavily secured, barring phones from the courtroom due to the case's high profile and concerns over witness safety, including an incident where co-defendants tried attacking U.S. Marshals. Robbing and kidnapping rival drug dealers and engaging in for high yes, Baltimore, there is a robust, active crime strategy. And anyone who says more is either intentionally uninformed or operating off of ulterior motives. Pete Offender is in Baltimore City. We are certain he has been involved in, believe me, it's a positive. We're not trying to hide anything from you. But at this point, the active investigations take precedence. The trial underscored the urgent need for an effective crime strategy in Baltimore, acknowledging the challenge of curbing city violence.
Steven Sanders, once the president of the San Diego Hells Angels, saw his world crumble in 2012 due to criminal charges, arrested for robbery with gang enhancements, assaults, and participating in gang-related attacks. Sanders even tried to eliminate potential witnesses to silence them. I've been here for multiple cases. I've been here for uh, armed robbery with a gang enhancement. I've been here for assaults. In April 2012, he admitted guilt to several crimes, including assaulting partygoers in Pacific Beach with a deadly weapon and kidnapping for gang advantages, aiming at rivals, officials, and innocents alike. They tried to label us a gang. We deny that. We're incorporated as a corporation. We pay federal and state taxes in the United States, and we, we adamantly deny that we're a gang. Sentenced to 25 years for his litany of offenses, including solicitation of murder, Sanders claimed his guilty plea was coerced by the fear of a stiffer penalty at trial. He lamented what he saw as targeted persecution by law enforcement and claimed a bias from the DA's office against his gang. I was definitely targeted by the, by the law enforcement agents. They, they, uh, these law enforcement officers are just flat out obsessed with trying to put me in other Hells Angels in jail. And the district attorney's office is biased against us, and they go along with it. Despite pleading guilty, Sanders later professed his and his gang's innocence, seeking to retract his plea through his lawyer, leveraging new testimonies, though unsuccessfully. The audio recordings are definitely were damaging to me, to my defense, and once they were manipulated and they had the conversations the way they wanted them, that's what ultimately convicted me. The DA's office and police underscored the compelling evidence against him, notably audio recordings, which were pivotal in his conviction. Leonid Greiser, who was on trial in Russia for taking the life of his sister, Ariana Carroll, tried to escape dramatically during a court session. He had admitted to the murder, saying he was commanded by Satan. For safety, he was kept in a secure glass enclosure in the Sherbinsky District Court in Moscow. Greiser attempted to escape by squeezing his upper body through a small window in the enclosure, but got stuck. He then tried to go through feet first, but was briefly stopped by a female guard grabbing his leg. However, he managed to pull away and looked for another way out. A male officer managed to draw his attention back, appearing to calm him with a conversation. Suddenly, Greiser climbed onto a bench and forced himself through a gap in the ceiling, pushing aside styrofoam tiles. Initially, the guards didn't take much action, but as Greiser started to disappear into the ceiling, they quickly moved to stop him. Even after being hit with a baton, Greiser kept trying to escape until a guard threatened him with a taser. Afraid of being tased, Greiser stopped, knocking down ceiling tiles and wires, and negotiated not to be tased. He then climbed back down into the enclosure, got dressed, and the court session continued with him handcuffed. Greiser was found guilty of murdering his sister and was unrepentant. He was sentenced to mandatory psychiatric treatment. In April 2010, Jack Dean Weaker was on trial for manslaughter charges stemming from an incident where he, under the influence, drove recklessly and crashed into 21-year-old Kayla Wilson from Gresham, Oregon. Wilson was five months pregnant at the time of the crash. The collision left her in a vegetative state, and tragically, she succumbed to complications from her injuries eight days later. During the trial, the courtroom was shocked by Weaker's behavior. Because the, 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 the jury found me guilty does not mean that I'm guilty. And that's why I cannot show remorse, because I did not do it. As members of Kayla Wilson's family read their victim impact statements, Weaker aggressively denied his involvement in the crash and interrupted the victim's family members, showing no remorse. Never know her mom and dad again. I and didn't I do it. I didn't do it. He justified his lack of remorse by claiming his innocence, despite being found guilty by the jury. This led to a disturbance in the courtroom, with Weaker repeatedly interrupting the proceedings and challenging the judge. You had a chance already. This is my opportunity. Yeah, well, I didn't do it. The case was emotional for all involved, including the judge, who expressed deep sympathy for the life-changing injuries suffered by Kayla, her daughter, and the rest of the family. I'm deeply sorry that you've had to endure the life-changing injuries to Kayla, I'm sorry. to her daughter, and to the rest of the family. On December 6, 2019, Weaker was sentenced to 16 years in prison for first-degree manslaughter. 
He reacted to his sentencing by claiming innocence and expressing that 11 years was excessive for someone who considers themselves innocent. 11 years? Yeah. For being innocent? You're kidding me. 11 years, that's enough. Additionally, his driving license was to be suspended for eight years after his release from prison. In Colorado's Jefferson County District Court, gang member Abel Gallegos received a sentencing for his role in the abduction and murder of 28-year-old Simone Duran. Duran had previously helped the police by identifying Alonzo Quintana in a separate murder case in 2018, which put her on the gang's radar. Gallegos enticed Duran to a parking lot on West Colfax via social media, where he and Quintana kidnapped her, took her to an empty lot, and fired at her 10 times. Gallegos, along with another gang member, Rene Francisco Rosales, later went back to the crime scene to burn Duran's body, showing a profound lack of respect for her life. Throughout his trial, Gallegos displayed no regret, even in the face of the victim's family's sorrow. Judge Philip McNulty, appalled by Gallegos's apathy and the brutality of the crime, sentenced him to 163 years in prison, emphasizing the crime's cold and brutal nature. This was a horrific crime. I, I am struck by the the casualness in, in which it was committed, the absolute disregard for human life. This sentence aimed to serve as a warning against gang violence, conveying a strong message to both gang members and the broader community about the severe repercussions of such actions. Danny Rowling, known as the Gainesville Ripper, was a serial killer who terrorized Gainesville, Florida in August 1990, taking the lives of five college students over four days. We would be remembered forever as someone that lost the Gainesville student murder cases, and that was, that was, um... Uh, you know, kind of terrifying. Before these murders, Rowling confessed to ending the lives of three individuals in Shreveport, Louisiana, and attempting to murder his father that same month. He was arrested in November 1991 and charged with five counts of murder. About four years later, he went on trial. I don't even know how much longer I'm going to be on this earth. But when I die, I hope I'm ready. I hope I die half as bravely as the people who perished in my Rowling, who idolized serial killer Ted Bundy, saw himself as a kind of celebrity, going so far as to sing in court during his sentencing. I recall the day I first saw you. I reached out to say I love you. But it was hard to say I couldn't touch you. After deliberating for about six hours over two days, the jury unanimously recommended the death penalty. He was eventually sentenced to death by electric chair. Imposed the death penalty upon Danny Harold Rowling. While the sentencing offered some relief to the victim's families, they expressed that it could not compensate for the loss of their loved ones. We just miss her a lot, and we know that nothing we ever do can bring her back. If they kill Danny Rowling, they lock him up forever. Christy will never come back, and so that's hard. That's why this will never be over. It will never be over for any of us. The prolonged period before Rowling's execution, which lasted nine years, was a painful and contentious time for the families involved. It shouldn't take nine years for him to go to, to get the, the, the chair. It, it can't take 10 years for, for him to go to the chair. I mean, why can't the chair just be in the courtroom? I mean, if the chair could be right there. I mean, this guy did, what they brought out on this trial was just monstrous, heinous, horrible things that it, it, it should not be tolerated. Rowling's execution marked a somber moment of closure for Gainesville, allowing the community to begin healing from the atrocities he committed. Hold on to our final clip, which is the most scariest and most creepiest one. And if you like what you saw, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on our creepiest videos. On November 25th, a serious road incident occurred involving Randy Vega and Dr. Patrick McGinty on Frazier Avenue leading to Vega crashing into a storefront and causing the deaths of two pedestrians. In court, Vega and his lawyer questioned the role of a Nissan Titan truck making contact with Vega's car before the crash. There's also, there's also another factor here. We have contact by the Nissan Titan truck, correct? I mean, would that not affect, would that not have a play into where the van was just a few feet before this? I mean, you can't say, I mean, I guess my story, you can't say for by looking at this, you know for a fact that that van merged left into the left lane. A responding officer reported signs of Vega's impairment at the scene, 
such as glassy eyes, a peculiar smell, and unusual conversational responses, hinting at alcohol consumption. Uh, I noticed that his eyes was glassy. I noticed that there was an unusual odor coming from his person. I noticed that there was uh, abnormal responses to conversations where it was not continual flow of conversation. Uh, there was some jumping around and it wasn't a continual normal conversation as two people would normally have, uh, which is indicative of possible signs of impairment. Vega's blood alcohol concentration was recorded at 0 .08 less than four hours following the incident. However, further disclosures in the hearing revealed hospital TBI results indicating a BAC of 0.13 and a separate test by Officer Lin showing a BAC of 0.148. Uh, the hospital blood the TBI results was a 0.13 BAC and the blood drawn by Officer Lin was a 0.08. Vega faces charges including two counts of vehicular manslaughter, DUI, and reckless driving, with a $1 million bond set for his release. In Tennessee, despite the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention extending the eviction moratorium to October, the Sixth Circuit found it unconstitutional, leading to numerous families appearing in eviction court. This decision, affecting Hamilton County among others, came as a blow to many, including long-term tenants like Nathena Tetri, who disputed a claim of owing more than $5,000 in back rent, having offered to pay over $3,000 during the pandemic. While the judge ruled she didn't owe the back rent, she was ordered to leave her home within 10 days. I've always tried to take care of my responsibilities, my bills, and everything that I need to do is well to make sure my children and I are taken care of. I offered to make sure that past due was taken care of, that it was paid, that I was not just staying in a home freeloading on him, just living and having free rent. That was not the case. This ruling from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals impacts states within its jurisdiction, including Kentucky, Ohio, and Michigan, and brings uncertainty to how other Tennessee courts will react, with some possibly waiting on further legal actions. They might be waiting for an appeal or a, another decision. I really don't know. I've only been in this courtroom today, and there are 95 counties in Tennessee. So um, I think that there are still a lot of things that are very unknown at this point. Judge Gary Starnes and a city attorney highlighted that financial aid is available for those affected by the pandemic through programs like those offered by the Tennessee Housing Development Agency. I feel bad for all of these folks, the tenants and the landlords. It's one of those situations where nobody puts you in this situation it, 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 for whatever reason, why, where it came from, whatever. Um, they're just in a bad situation. And unfortunately, it, it, when it ends, which it has in Tennessee, you've got to do something. Judge Starnes, facing the tough decisions in eviction court, sympathizes with both tenants and landlords caught in these pandemic-induced difficult situations. He suggests looking into unemployment and financial assistance, though he acknowledges the aid has been slow to reach those in need. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can stay updated with our latest videos.